You're watching Doc Review with me, Camelia Shambayati. In today's show, we're discussing Gun Runners, directed by Canadian documentary filmmaker Anjali Nayar. And joining me in the studio, we have Lee Singer, who is a film journalist and video essayist, whose work has appeared in various major newspapers, magazines, and online outlets. And beside him is Tete Kofi, who is a journalist and broadcaster. Now, Gun Runners, which is shot over a 10-year period, follows two Kenyan cattle rustlers, who are also known as warriors, Julius Arile and Robert Matanda, who put their violent past behind them to become marathon runners as part of a government-sponsored program to disarm the conflict-heavy region. We see Arile enter international marathons, while Matanda gets involved in the political sphere and dreams of working towards policy change. Though, as we see these once notorious warriors given a chance to pursue their dreams, we realize that the road to glory is full of bumps and detours for these charismatic men. Let's have a look at our first clip. When you have a gun, you have power. You feel like nobody can kill you. But when somebody kills you, you think about anything that can help you to run away. If I win, my life will be changed. Well, first of all, welcome both of you to the show. Thanks very much for coming on. Now, Kenya is known as a destination for world-class marathon runners, but as we see in this documentary, it's not as glamorous as it seems to be a top athlete in that part of the world, particularly because some of them are quite literally running for their lives, uh, running away from crime, and we see that cattle stealing, or cattle wrestling as it's called, um, it's quite commonplace because that's an important source of income and this region is also engulfed in the illegal arms trade industry which is part of a global multi-billion dollar industry. Lee, if I could start with you as our guest film critic, what was your take on this documentary? Well firstly, it's just a fascinating sort of insight into you know, a situation that I really did not know much about. You know, you, I know very well that Kenya is a history of producing great runners. I didn't know about this you know, pretty fantastic government-run program, this sort of amnesty and the disarmament idea, which is a really great one and obviously it gives a great film title then, Gun Runners. Um, the film itself, I mean, I think it was shot over 10 years, so I, you know, you can only imagine how much footage has been accumulated during that time. And I guess, as fascinating as I found the subject and the two principal characters, I felt that in a sort of 90-minute running time, you're kind of skipping big chunks, you know, so much is going on and I didn't feel that I was getting to know the two men in the way that I would have liked. I mean, basically, I could imagine a longer film that would, I would have maybe, you know, it's longer but you would have felt more in getting into the rhythm of what's going on with these people because there's so much to say and they, and they go through so many changes, both of them individually, and I feel 90 minutes doesn't necessarily do justice to everything that you know, it's trying to encapsulate. You're right, it is absolutely jam-packed. It touches on issues of violence, as well as the main theme, which is sports and running, but then also politics and corruption. There's just so much in this documentary. And Tete, if I could turn to you, what was your take on gun runners? Okay, normally, when I'm told about documentaries about Africa, I go, I yawn, roll my eyes and go, oh God, not again. I tend to want to avoid them. Um, I was very present, pleasantly surprised by this for two reasons. One, it was rich in context. 
so that whatever was going through the lives of these two, the, the protagonists, if you like, um, it was placed within context and it gave you an understanding of the environment from which they came. Secondly, I think it was done with cons quite a lot of sensitivity. Um, there's little tricks he used in what you call chopping and changing. I mean, cutting from the Rift Valley, training scenes mm. in, Which in is absolutely camps, breathtaking. But, uh, exquisite. Um, in, in Kenya, over to the skyscrapers of New York, <clears throat> you could see that these are two little people um, operating in one world, but kind of moving out into a much, much bigger, bigger world. And the third thing I really liked about it was that it looks as if these two characters are archetypes. Um, a really is very much the superstar, um, the, the, the very talented runner and so on. And his mate, Matanda, is, seems to be much more the political type. So how the two characters fare was something I was always watching to see. Um, so yeah, I, I was impressed. I'd like to pick apart their characters a bit later on. Sure. Believe I'd like to ask you, this documentary kind of describes itself as the American dream, but Kenyan style. It's an interesting analogy. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm always, I'm always a bit puzzled by this <clears throat> American dream. I don't understand why you know, one country has a monopoly on wanting to change <laughs> your life for the better and improve your situation. I mean, it's a, it's a cute tagline. I think it's kind of irrelevant. The fact is, yes, they do go to New York and you know, run marathons there, but you know, marathon running is a world global pursuit. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to me it smacks more of marketing than any sort of reality. Can, you know, why, why can't it be a Kenyan dream? Mm. That's a good point indeed. And it's a good time to pause now and look at another clip from Gun Runners about the Kenyan amnesty program to swap guns for running shoes. Today marks the first annual Tekla Lorupe Peace Race. Tekla Lorupe, the former marathon world record holder from the conflict region, is partnering with the government to invite cattle rustlers to trade in their weapons in exchange for amnesty and a chance to win cows and cash prizes. As in maybe standard three, I heard about Tekla. Tekla is my relative. First African woman to win New York Marathon. I say yes, if it is my relative, if and me, I can run. It's all of us that we are here today, it's because of peace. Now we don't want tomorrow to to Nangana Manania peace. If we are here, we are here, we are here, we are here. from this film that this amnesty program is quite inspirational. How does it transform uh, the lives of Aurelia Matanda, Lee? Well, I mean, you know, until this uh, program comes in, they are very aware that they're living a very precarious, you know, de highly dangerous existence, and one that they're very clearly both uncomfortable with. You know, it does involve, the, they don't answer it directly, but you very much get the sense that they've been involved in deaths and obviously they've had loved ones or friends die as well. So it's, a, it's just a really unpleasant, you know, precarious existence. So this government program is really trying to give people a kind of a firmer foothold in, I guess, you know, quote unquote, the right direction. So taking them away from sort of illegal activities, illegal guns, and trying to sort of, you know, push their energies and their sort of, uh, their, you know, their outlook in a more kind of positive and, uh, you know, peaceful direction, so that's a great thing. And Tete, the film sheds a positive light on this amnesty program. How effective is it really, and can you talk more a bit about this? Well, the, I mean, there are a couple of things which come out. They, for, for a program to work, you've got to be able to transfer skills which are being adversely used or, or not constructively used into something which is positive. 
and in the way they, the story pans out with these two characters, uh, Matanda is very much the organiser. I mean, he had 500 effectively gangsters, hoodlums, we, they call themselves rustlers, um, under his charge. So this guy's a people organiser, and of course he's the one whose skills are now deployed in the political arena, actually getting people involved with the programme, even campaigning for, for a parliamentary candidate, and he says he himself has parliamentary aspirations. Then Aurelia, on the other, other hand, is the, the rising star, the, the hugely talented in, individual. They said that even as a kid he was winning things at kind of... At, at, at the local level so his skills his competitive drive is now being you know applied in an arena which can actually make him money improve the quality of his personal life the life of his family and so on and it, it does it does say that a lot depends on the quality of government the environment you provide these these talents are available in bad neighborhoods and they're available in the right postcodes the difference is is that in the, the right postcode or, or, or a stable environment those talents are able to flourish because they are positively deployed so in terms of this gun amnesty um, Kenya had a problem I think it was a, a blindingly inspired um, idea um, it's the, one of the funniest quotes I actually picked up from this was he said, "Well, the skills I need to run uh, to chase to rustle are to chase. I need to be able to run fast to chase cattle, and I need to be run fast to escape the police." And he's doing that in the marathon. A That's exactly is, the point of this film: is that violence goes hand in hand exactly. with their ability exactly. to be good athletes. Yeah. And Leif, if I could ask you, a <coughs> issue, an issue that is raised in this documentary is that when you have a gun, you have a sense of power. So it seems as if it's an accepted reality or part of life in Kenya. There's an amazing quote, and to be honest, it's the thing that probably stayed with you most from this film. I think it's Matanda he's talking. He's like, you know, if you haven't killed someone, if you haven't stolen their property, then what kind of a warrior are you? And to me, this is really then, what they're actually really trying to do underline is change the whole paradigm of what makes a warrior or actually a man. And actually, that's something that is a huge, that, that's not just particular to this country. It's something we probably all need to look at in you know, different societies, the way we construct masculine identity. And it shouldn't be about trying to dominate and power and you know, impose yourself. And I think actually, he doesn't, they don't explore that anymore, sadly, I felt in this. Mm. But the fact that he vocalizes it shows that actually it's making him reconsider what, you know, as a warrior, he should be doing. And then the fact that he goes into more sort of, you know, political and sort of socially constructive things is obviously mm. helping that situation. So I know you'd like to jump in, but we're just going to pause just for a second as we take a look at another clip from Gun Runners, which shows Robert Matanda tell us about the significance of marathon running. When I was in the bush, I used to run. That's why when I came here, I didn't find it difficult when I started to, 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 to run. Because I was running even 100 kilometers. You know, when the police is chasing you, also you chase the cattle. Hmm? So you chase very fast. But if you chase very slowly, the police will capture you. And then you will, you will be in a hot soup. Outside, the people are running. Town breathes, eats, sleeps, imagines, fantasizes, athletics. The, the ads one out of ten that you can make money out of it. And one in the fifty to really make money out of it and start really changing your life. The luck of getting a manager that supports you and brings you to races for around a 15% commission is crucial. There is a big boulevard of broken dreams here in Nite. A big one, a big, big, big one. But some people walk over the boulevard of broken dreams, still thinking they can make it.
I found both characters to be quite endearing, um, but I think Matanda was the more charismatic one out of the two. And we get the sense that he had a much darker past than Aurelie. There was a moment when he was asked how many people he's killed, and he just looks off camera and remains silent, which is quite chilling to watch. Lee, what did you make of Matanda's uh, character compared to Aurelie's? Yeah, I mean, one of the strengths of the film is that they are very different. So you have that immediate contrast. And Tete's, uh, you know, described it very well. Matanda's the sort of more social, you know, political animal. He has a natural ability and affinity to kind of, you know, draw people in. Arile is much more kind of, you know, quieter, more sort of focused on his own sort of goals. And so that, I think, is one of the main strengths of the film, because as you follow their paths, you find that actually they diverge more than you might expect, because actually they aren't equally talented runners. So then one storyline really pursues the actual running side of it, and the other goes, I would say, into equally or maybe more interesting avenues about, well, if you can't do that, it's not just, you know, guns or running. Actually, if that, if if the running is not going to be your career, you can use your skills in different ways. And I think that's a, that's a very interesting... And we see avenue. Matanda pursue politics, but then of course we learn that it seems to be a corrupt world and it's almost, uh, he embraces it and talks about it openly, hmm. openly rather. Uh, Tete, is this a reality of life in Kenya? It's a reality of life in Kenya and not just Kenya, uh, a lot of African countries. Um, it's also the reality of life over here. But it's, it's because there's a lot more wealth and because ordinary people's needs uh, are taken care of on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you don't see it as starkly. But in Kenya, it's very clear. I mean, he threatens the politician that if you don't make me, you know, minister in charge of security, which he patently won't be able to hold, he wouldn't be able to hold that position. He said he'd, he'd mobilise things against him. And but the, uh, what it says to me is that these individual talents are... Uh, kind of drawn into this prism of organization, be it the sport, be it politics, be it whatever. And it is the quality of the organization that can absolutely, you know, enable them or absolutely destroy them. And I want to touch quickly on the point about guns. Um, we find out from in this documentary also that there's 500,000 illegal guns in Kenya. I mean, mm -hmm. where are they coming from and why are they there? Well, I mean, there, there was a breakup of the Soviet Union, and that led to a huge kind of splurge of, of small arms uh, all over the world. And, of course, these things are what are required to create um, kind of little lordships in all of these different countries. And it is one of the saddest statistics of African life that is that where there are the greatest resources, you have the greatest conflicts. So a country like the Congo which is incredibly wealthy, has had internecine strife for near on 40 years consecutively. Of course, while that happens, the natives can't benefit from the resources in their land, but other agents do. And unfortunately, it is often foreign agents who enable these weapons to get into the hands of these people. And so that it's it's almost a system of divide and rule mm. but of course you know if you're a politician in africa and you're accepting bribes from foreign um, agents to create conf conflict and strife in your own country that's a decision only you can make nobody holds a gun to your head to do that so it comes to issues around personal integrity and so on and so mm. forth that's a really interesting point but i'm afraid we'll have to move on just for the time being as it's time now to take a look at our final clip from gun runners where Arile talks about how he turned his life around through marathon running. I dream about my future. Mostly I dream about money. I will build this, I will build that. Many things like that. My name is uh, Julius Arile from Kenya. Six years ago, being a warrior, fighting with uh, another people from our country. But this time now, I am an athlete, and I can run a marathon. <laughs> he really does need to make a breakthrough. And if he doesn't have it, then it's going to be harder to, to fulfill this kind of dream of being in New York as an elite, top elite athlete that 
to maybe make it in the top five. Good morning and welcome to Prague, Czech Republic for the 19th running of the Volkswagen Prague Marathon. A great race start in Prague's old town square in this historic city. So really is very much the underdog character in this documentary and you really find yourself rooting for him. He has a lot of pressure on himself to prove himself and he dreams of being on the wall, as he says, of all the top runners of Kenya. And we see him come seventh place in the, the first race and then, but then do really well in the second opportunity he has. What did you make of this sort of triumphant arc he had? Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess when you're choosing the, your characters to focus on at the beginning of a journey, you have no idea actually are they going to make it and stuff. So I think it's less, it, I mean, it sounds a cliche, but it's less about the destination than the journey. It's fascinating to follow this particular man on his sort of athletics career. Now, if he, you know, ends up winning a gold medal at the Olympics, even more extraordinary. But actually, I find it more interesting when you see the real struggles and the person who isn't necessarily going to be the ultimate victor in this. The film really drew. Uh, made me think about an American documentary called Hoop Dreams mm -hmm. from the 1990s which followed two young inner city kids who wanted to be basketball stars. Now neither of them end up making it but what you get is a fascinating portrait of their environment and the world that they're in and the politics and the social disadvantages and actually that's a more illuminating and I think more fascinating storyline than just you know the underdog who comes from nowhere to you know in the last minute you know storms to it. the front and wins the wins the medal that's interesting but I'm more interested in the sort of the world that there that mm -hmm. shapes their their you know of course he's plagued by poverty and injuries and not the same opportunities um Tete I see you agreeing with uh, Lee there but absolutely the journey is fascinating and um none of these characters are pristine um, a relay um, got somebody pregnant when he was when she was quite young. It led to her suicide and led to him becoming a warrior. Then later on, he's now got three wives with, and children by all of them. Um, so, if he's if he's not able to take that, put each one of his problems in some kind of compartment, he won't be able to pursue his dream. So these dreams are always fraught. And actually, the story, as as you say very well. Is, is the compromises, you know, the, 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 the calls that each person has to make to pursue what it is that they're really after, and an illumination of the environment within which all of this is going on. Mm -hmm. I want to talk now about the parallels uh, we see between Kenya and the US, sort of the Western world. Lee, what did you make of their journey, um, of Relay's journey to, to New York, and sort of the observations and comments he was making? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's very much sort of fish out of water stuff, right? So, you know, where they've grown up, where they live, what they're used to is obviously a world away from, you know, the slightly you know, more glamorous, the more professional, the more kind of money at stake world that they go into. But I think, again, what's really interesting is in their own world as well, you see the way that they're not quite fitting in and the, the problems that they have. And to be honest, I would have liked the film to touch more on that. Like Tete says, they have these very checkered family lives. That's not really grappled with in the way that I would have, you know, appreciated a bit more. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, of course the thread is the running and the marathon and what happens, but actually to get to know them even a bit more as characters and, and get a, a sort of a more rounded portrait of them, I would have liked to hear more about those sort of difficulties with the families and the wives and the kids mm -hmm. because it obviously has an impact. He wants to earn money so he can go back mm -hmm. and provide for them, but we don't necessarily get, you know, the full story about what that entails. And Teddy, isn't it quite sad though that this notion of success, we see a relay move to sort of a shack-like uh, accommodation and mm. he thinks he's living in a European city. Um, why is that the, this, this connection of success is linked to Europe and the West? Well, well success is, is always relative to what you've got. I mean, this guy wasn't having three, three baths a week out in the bush and he's suddenly in a, in a shack with running water. I mean, that's luxury. He might as well, from his point of view, be at the Ritz Hotel. Um, so it's, it's absolutely relative. But what I, I think it's important for people to, to also think about is the fact that this can be quite corrupting. It read, I mean, this, this kind of drive to live in that star-spangled environment can be quite corrupting. 
because we all know that the industry that he's now becoming a part of, the elite athletics industry, mm -hmm. is also incredibly corrupt. Which is mainly dominated, sort of, as we see, by Western uh, physiotherapists yeah. and management types. Sure. It, it, it's incredibly corrupt. So um, it's really a story about how you know, man has to try and make it, making moral judgments at every turn of the way in a not so easy world. Mm. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining Doc Review. And that's it for this episode of Doc Review. Thank you to both my guests and to you for watching. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find us on at Doc Review Show. And do let us know your views on today's film and you can even suggest a documentary that you would like us to review. I've been Camila Shambayati and see you on the next episode of Doc Review.